Uh, before we start, I request uh, Professor Nigarida to briefly introduce Deepa. Uh, good morning, all of you. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Deepan Manerji, alumnus from our school. He passed out his LLB in the year 2014. Basically, he is an uh, electronics engineer by uh, <laughs> profession, and also now he is a, uh, a registered patent agent, and uh, see, he is associated with uh, Dr. Martin Lakshmiwaran as his uh, senior associate uh, in now for the last four years. And uh, he has uh, <laughs> and he has extensive experience in drafting and trading and also taking various procedural aspects of the patents. And uh, we are very glad uh, to have you here with us. And I hope that uh, his talk on this uh, recent trends in patenting on AI and IoT things will be very helpful because given the spectrum of students from various backgrounds in our IIT, and that is a what you call a um, hot topic these days, AI, uh, your Internet of Things and everything. So, again, welcome Mr. Deepan to our school again. And uh, please, uh, you can right. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And it's been a pleasure to be back to IIT. And it's an honor, sir, and everyone else, to give me a chance to speak in this uh, forum. Uh, I have kept this more oriented towards technology and less oriented towards patents. And, uh, but we will move forward with this understanding and then we will see where we lead with this. So, uh, this, this I will be talking about the recent trends in the field of patenting. So, it is a very broad subject. So, I have tried, tried to narrow it down to a buzzword. So, IoT is basically a, um, uh, I think people would know that it is the new buzzword and uh, everything and uh, anything and everything under the sun is part of IoT. So what is this IoT? Uh, I think people would know here. Everyone knows? Yeah? Yeah, sure. So it is basically, so this is how I will run through the slides. Uh, it is, uh, firstly I will give an introduction of what IoT is and what the basic of IoT is. And now when it comes to challenges, with patenting of IoT related inventions, uh, it comes to where we should first identify in which area of IoT the invention lies. So I have tried to, I have tried to uh, classify it or try to categorize it in different uh, area where the invention can lie in IoT scenario. So what's basically an IoT? So now uh, that's basically I'm going to cover in IoT. Then I tried to think that what's the impact of this. And considering the Indian market, why are we so much interested in IoT? And is, it, is this interest really guided and justified and why? So I'll, I'll just put up some slides and some data to see that where IoT is taking us and why are we so much interested in IoT. I will talk about the features of IoT inventions, specifically the categories in which they can lie and the different kind of painting aspects related to that. Then. I will give some real life examples how IoT is impacting day to day life, maybe lives of people who we think that as are not linked to technology, for example farmers, how they are also benefited by IoT and then I will talk about patentability of IoT and now again, now I, it, as my uh, uh, site summary says, that it's regarding IoT and its enabling technology. So IoT cannot function on its own, and as we know, there are different kinds of technologies that help in function of IoT. I would go and touch upon the cloud and edge computing technologies. I'll go into how AI is helping in IoT, and I'll again go to the 5G technology and what is the recent trend that is coming up in 5G and what is the hype about 5G and why is that there? And the Patenting aspect, what are the problems, what are the challenges that may come up and what some, there is another story there with regard to the last part of 5G. So, first with the focus of, uh, with the, this understanding in mind, what is IoT? So, things here basically, the word things in the, uh, in the title IoT, it basically means anything. It can be a, any real physical thing. It can be a human, it can be uh, measurement getting to a soil, it can be weather measurements, it can be measurements of a vehicle, it can be uh, traffic data, it can be anything. So what is basically IoT? It's basically an interconnection of devices which can capture information 
and transfer information. That's it. Yes, there is some processing and analysis part to it as well. But it, these devices should be able to capture. So it includes all kinds of sensors that may be used in industries, that may be used in a power plant, that may be used in energy, in home utilities, for example, a fridge and a washing machine. It can be uh, devices like heart, heart rate monitor, it can be devices like fetal rate monitors, everything. All these data can be, these devices, the sensors can be made intelligent enough and smart enough to capture this, store this at a, for a transient time period and then transfer it to a bigger center. Let's call, let, let it be a da either a data center or a cloud or anywhere else and then there is a processing involved. So now th this gives to the risk, th then we come to the aspect of where can the invention lie in IoT scenario. So, this is basically where it lies. So, first of all, it is about the sensors. So, it is basically the electrical or electronic sensors where, which will capture the data and then it will transmit the data. So, these sensors may be installed in different uh, power plants and in, in, in any kind of uh, physical objects. And these sensors are becoming intelligent day by day. For example, these IEDs, they can then transfer this information to some place where it will be stored and then analyze. So first part is sensing data. So inventions relating to sensing data and IoT become important. Why? Uh, now again, a question will come up that why am I saying if it's an inventional sensor, why am I not saying that it's an inventional sensor? Why am I saying that it's, it's an inventional IoT? The reason being the impact of that invention has to be brought up. So when I'm saying I'm making a sensor intelligent, the impact of that intelligent sensor, what it is doing, it also has to be brought out in a, let's say, in a, patent, in a, in a, in a patent document. So that is why I'm saying it's part of an IoT environment. Then the next part of it is data communication. So in data communication, as you know, that there will be some inventions that would be related to protocols, the communication protocols, the technology that are used for communication, and some would be with regard to devices that are enabling this kind of communication. So there are again two aspects of this kind of, an, of data communication. Then it's data analysis, it's called data collection, they are calling it. Now data collection may again happen at a centralized server or at a cloud, or there, and now there's a uh, term coming up with regard to data collection happening at the edge, that is at the edge by the eye, when I say edge it means more closer to the sensor itself. So what the idea is, they are trying to move the intelligence from the cloud towards the sensors. The reason being is, first one, reduction of latency of transferring the data and then again analyzing it there at the cloud and then moving it back. And the second part is reduction of usage of bandwidth and that is associated with costs. For example, if I transfer data from a sensor to the cloud and then the cloud analyzes it and sends me back, the amount of time and the amount of bandwidth that's consumed there is much more. And this becomes more important in financial transactions. For example, I am going to an ATM machine, I swipe my card here, and then that thing, if let's say it is like a centralized server somewhere in US or in the cloud. So they will send that data, match those passwords, and then send me back the input. So where I have two two seconds leverage, two to three seconds of leverage. So in that case, these moving that moving that intelligence closer to the sensor, like for example to a router or to a gateway. So they are making intelligent routers or intelligent gateways that have the capability of processing this kind of data. So now this is a new again an upcoming field of edge computing that they are talking about. So one is cloud and one is edge. It's also between the cloud and the device and the actual device. So this is again a part of data collection and the data analysis. And data analysis is again the hot topic AI. So predictive analysis of data and where we are using this kind of data to feed it to a model. And that model will eventually start applying the learnings from that data set into newer data sets which are not fed into it. So this kind of predictions will come from, an from a data analysis perspective and typically these data analysis will are generally carried out at the cloud level or the central data center level and not at the edge because these are again memory con consuming and processor consuming uh, entities. So this is how where the inventions could lie in each of the sectors. So and where the impact, so again where the impact of these things lie. 
the impact of these things basically lie in smart industries, smart livings, the smart wearable. For example, we are having wearing a smart watch. It's capturing our movement data. It's sending to some server, and then again, an input is coming from there. You have and you have spent so many number of steps. This is how your health is being monitored. This is how your uh, your day-to-day uh, -day activity is being monitored, and you get an output that you are a healthy person today. Tomorrow, you don't know whether you are. But so this is how these things are going to uh, impact our daily life. So so what is patentable? Like let's say if we talk about let's say some sensor we have better, particularly say healthcare which I am working on. Mm -hmm. So when I say that I have sensors, IoT based sensors, which can like I, it can sense something and then it can transfer the data to some cloud server for analysis and other things and get it back. Correct. Okay. So I have to develop the sensors, I have to develop the electronics also, which can actually, you know, electronics is not definitely is noble, but we integrated everything. I mean, it's not exactly repeating something, but that may not be the, you know, noble part of it. Okay. The sensor is noble. Yeah. So which part would be the patent level? Like you can have patents for each of these parts. For example, if you have some, have done something novel in the sensor itself, for example, in the sensor design. Yes, it can be better, like we understood, we can understand the sensor part also included. It can it be built as a system as well. For example, as a part of a bigger system, like an IoT environment, where the sensor is capturing the data and maybe sending that data to somewhere else. Now, the sending part as such is known. That's very right. Once you transfer it to the server, then... Uh, and the capturing part as such is known. But if you are doing something, for example, many uh, now many smart sensors are coming on. What they are doing is they are duplicating the data in the sensor itself. Okay. So, for example, I need some meaningful insights at the end of it to control that actuator for, for some actuator near, near the sensor. So, what they are doing is they are putting an intelligence either near the sensor or coupled to the sensor, where that intelligence can give only those inputs which are required to get my meaningful insight, meaningful output meaningful insight of, of controlling the actuator. So when when this this entire system can also be patented saying that there's a new function that is coming out that I am doing something more than only capturing the data with that sense. So, so you remember so you think of it as aspirin. Okay? Then I say no A B C D. Then you put it along with something else. A plus B. Then I put A plus B plus C. Then I can have method. So that's how you would make a story. And you need to capture all of that. So that air but remember, thing, you know, your aspirin is like your sensor, correct? I need to have a patent only for that sensor. Whether I put it somewhere or there, don't worry about it. So huh? yesterday I gave the example of an intermediate. The intermediate is not what I'm selling in the market. The intermediate is there where I need it in the process step. And I can still patent that. So remember, you don't have to actually patent what is your product out in the market. No. You need to see what is the novelty, what is your problem, and what is the solution, and that is your first independent claim. Like he said, the second independent claim can be with electronic. The third independent claim can be with all these going to the cloud, capturing, doing everything. The fourth, I don't know. And so when I have only for a sensor, whether the sensor is an A device, B device, or C device, it should be captured. So at the sensor they use anywhere, you should get the right for it. So don't say sensor with this when you are narrowing down your pattern. Okay, so that's how you work on it. You must think of every time I think of a novel, remember I must have a pattern for that novelty. I can stop everybody from using that sensor in any device. Okay, so I have another question. Is that let's say uh, as you said that you know the patent should be like more general, like but focusing to a particular problem. Now, if let's say I have I have something something I have developed with some material mm. and uh, that I have patented. Post for that material. Right. Actually it improves it many times. I would write that material in something like that. I would. But if the material was just making a small improvement, you forgot to add that material in your first, then it will be an addition. It's an improvement. Okay? So both are improvements. So what you must understand the level of improvement. It's path breaking, then I like to have a separate invention. So that material, if people use it in any other things, you need to capture it. But if it's just an improvement over your invention, then you can have a patent of addition 
or a divisional, if you have not put it there, then you find another pattern. So my question is, let's say I demonstrated with one material. Yes. And somebody else is demonstrated the same thing with different material. Mm. So I should have like tested and put it in. Yeah. Because there is like group of materials, this is true for so that is why we write that in the laundry list. And we keep asking people, oh you've done it with A. So let's say I put corn starch. But I say, can I put wheat starch? Can I put rice starch? Can I put this starch? So that's where we have this invent inventor meetings is, what are the other materials I can do? But if I have not understood your invention, I may not be able to ask the right question. So it's important for inventors to tell me every aspect of it and then we will question you. Can I have different materials? You say, yes. It's already known in the art, doesn't matter. I'll put that in the laundry list. So to stop everybody you from... You need data it. for supporting data for No, all. you don't need supporting data for all. You may need for one or two is enough. Because a person skilled in the art will know by using instead of A, instead of a B material, instead of a C material, they will do. But to come up with something completely novel material, then it's a completely new invention. So every time, this is why we need to have this close meeting. So when he goes for inventor meeting, he's actually sitting face to face and talking to them and understanding. And that's why when I do for IIT Delhi, the same professor comes along, I want the same person who is drafting it, I want them, because they have already understood 80%. I have to only explain them the 20%. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. If, looking at the Ashton example, mm -hmm. if the main sensor itself is a patented, mm -hmm. the first thing, I am trying to use it, incorporate into my product and I am coming out of, I am using another different set of sensors which are already patented somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I come out with a product out of it, I put them, I assemble them. I put them on a, on a microprocessor, so you must be doing a microprocessor. Yeah. So I put them on a microprocessor and I get the data out of it. So is that product? It is patent to But I don't have I the right freedom to operate. Freedom to operate is a different question. Whether you have a patent and the people who are having the patent will look at your patent and buy your patent. You can actually go back to them and say, look what I have done with this. You may not have freedom to operate. But freedom to operate is also jurisdictional. Did they come to India and file a patent? If they didn't, you have freedom to operate. So freedom to operate actually should be done as a full seminar. It's a very, very complex thing. But remember that when you put all these in the microprocessor and it is giving you a better effect, it is okay. But like he will say 3F, you're just putting A plus B plus C and it is just an um, aggregation of components, you will not get it. But the aggregation of components is doing something more than this. So 1 plus 2 plus 3, correct? 3 plus 2, 5 plus 1, 6, but it should be doing 7. It should have some synergistic effect. It should have some technical effect. Because of which you will get. So again, think of the problem solution approach. So it's basically the focus. Where you are focusing on the material, then you go into that and what are the different options? If it's the interaction you're talking about, the interaction, the interaction with the sensors are interacting, the way the sensors are, the data from the sensors is processed. So we'll go into the depths of it and how is the data. So last question is so, decision making based on that data collection. Can yeah. and that particular point be picked? Yeah, so again, it's depending on the technology that you're using there. So again, this question is a bit fact specific. So Data analysis based on the collected uh, analysis of the collected data that, for example, we are presently doing a lot of inventing based on AI. So now that's basically data analysis. Now it is done on a again with thinking of AI inventions. I'll come to that again later. Thinking of AI inventions, there come certain challenges as well. So I'll follow up with that. I'll fill up with. It. Okay, I'll move on to the next. So Can we have it a little, I mean, at the end? Hey, let's, so, let's stop, stop, because you know yeah, what? Yeah, we'll not be able to... We'll not finish at all. Yes, we'll have it at the end. We'll, we'll have it at the end, or I don't mind doing it in the afternoon. But let's keep all he, your he, questions, keep your questions and writing it. Yeah. He will be available in the second half. Yes, right. he is also he, available. Yeah, he's available. Right? You can interact with him as much as you want. Even yes. I'm in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want you to do. Yeah. Yes. So, uh... Now IoT, now why this IoT has created a hype and what is the impact of IoT? I just have gathered some data from the NASCOM website. It says that 1.3 billion USD is the entire market share of IoT in only the industrial and commercial uh, appliances sector. So 
that is the impact that's there. It does not involve home appliances, it does not involve automobiles. I'll just like to add here, it does not show it here, but automobiles is another sector where, where IoT is just booming there. What now you already know, smart cars, connected cars, all these are coming from big companies like for example Ford and Porsche and they are into this IT space and vehicle-less cars. So all these, so are we, without that only in India, it's 1.3 billion. So that is the impact on the market side and why people would be interested. So if someone comes to you, why are you interested in this smart IoT car? Because, because this is the reason that is there. So government of India is ready to invest 1.3 billion dollars in this only industrial, already invested basically in the industrial and consumer IoT solutions. Next, uh, it's uh, a prediction analyst of NASCOM says that by 2020, the target is investing of 15 billion USD in the IoT market. Now, again, ma'am just talked about startups. So, and where are they working on? So, startups find their, uh, we need startups, need the regulatory requirement, they need to make a paper trail. I am going to talk about where they are working on. At least, so there are 120 uh, IoT organizations in India. I mean, IoT, by saying IoT organizations, I mean they are in, uh, involving in IoT solutions, providing IoT solutions. Almost half of them, or more than half of them, are startups. So this is where the startups are involved in, and the space that they have identified, where the next upcoming boom is there. So almost. Half of the, more than half, it says 60% to 65% of the startups uh, of the IoT organizations are startups there, only in India. So it again says that investment made in startups offering innovative IoT solutions. So again, this is uh, only the 60 million dollars that startups have invested in IoT. It's the data only up to 2014, but you can see almost half of the total market share is invested by startups. So this gives a idea that the funders or the accelerating companies which are there, they are ready to spend money on this kind of inventions. And why is this, and why are these investors so much interested? Because the government of India is promoting this. There, I will go into that separately and the government of India is basically planned, of, planned for 100 smart cities for which IoT, they are looking at IoT as the biggest uh, enabler of those kind of smart cities. So connected car, vehicle-less cars, where industries would be connected to a central cloud and all those things are would be implemented in those 100 smart cities and by 2020 they have planned an, uh, an investment of 1 billion in those smart cities. So also uh, this is a, just a plan that's showing what the government of India is uh, planning for IoT market in India. Also, I just wanted to share that under uh, this present uh, government, there is uh, IO, the first IoT policy has been drafted in India. So the Department of Information Technology, they have drafted the smart, uh, first IoT policy and India is one of the early countries in which IoT, there is an IoT policy that has been drafted. This is this is the fact, this is the market share in which the IoT, uh, this is the technology wise division in which IoT market is divided here. So firstly you can see telecommunications is leading followed by electronics, oil and energy. And also in pharma and healthcare also there are certain IoT based inventions in healthcare, majorly invo involving AI and healthcare. So there is also a significant development there. Now this was what I was talking about. Now, while looking at an IoT invention, and uh, again, it should not be called as an IoT invention, it should be looked at sectors of IoT where the invention lies. So here, the invention can very well lie, as Dr. said, in the sensors or terminals or the, the, in fact, in the sensor bodies where this thing, the data is getting captured. It can very well be in the data communication platform. It can be in the platform or it can be in the protocols. For example, it can be in the 3G or 4G or 5G uh, technologies uh, standards that will be implemented. It can be in the data collection part as well. Yeah. So here, this data collection part is again divided into 
as I said, into the edge and the cloud. So data will be collected at the edge, some processing of the data is done there, and then major part of the data will be pushed into the cloud where further deep analysis and deep learning kind of algorithms run, and they give further predictive inputs on that. So, and data analysis, which is basically now, presently, more AI based. Yeah. I'll just try to uh, come with two real life examples where uh, two years back, GE uh, tied up with British uh, Petroleum where they have tried to predict the uh, life of an oil well. Uh, so British Petroleum has several oil wells throughout the uh, globe and what they are trying to do is, so it is very difficult to predict the amount of oil that will be flowing from each well and based on that the amount of drilling activity and they have to plan a lot of things, a lot of logistics based on that. So what they have done is they have teamed up with GE and GE is going to set up, is basically setting up an infrastructure where they will have smart sensors gather different inputs, for example temperature of the mine, the kind of uh, geo geo geographical inputs that are coming from the, uh, the region in which the oil well is there. Uh, the stability based, the earth, earth stability based inputs through uh, different sensors from that area and then they are going to feed that to a central system or to the cloud and there they, based on those data they are going to analyze. So now IoT inventions are lying at each and every step of it. So implementing those sensors in maybe, maybe it may or may not lie in the sensors that in the sensors and then communicating that data, okay, it may be done on standard technology, but analyzing that data. So the last part, collection and analysis of data is really becoming important and that's why people are more into AI. So they would obviously need AI systems and machine learning algorithms to predict how this big data is going to going to have an going to have an impact over the next 20 years over the oil mill. So they, they can basically predict the uh, the time span up to which this oil will oil well will be functional, and accordingly they can also uh, they can also plan there. They can also plan the efficiency and estimating the life of the oil wells. Another example uh, at, uh, where IoT has an impact on the grassroots level of uh, uh, of the uh, of the population is basically where uh, in a case where the Lincoln University in New Zealand what they have tried is they have built up an AI system and they have implemented, they have connected it with the IoT scenario. How? So they have initially what happened was New Zealand is known, I mean they have different wine, uh, vineyards and they are, they are into wine manufacturing. So what they have to do is they have to, uh, they have manual labor. So they used to uh, take bunches, so grapes are grown in this rows and columns. So what they have to do is, they have to collect the bunches of grapes from there and then uh, manually someone has to count it to predict and, and based on that data, they put the data in this uh, normal pen and paper and they had some algorithms in place based on which they used to predict what would be the yield for the next season and accordingly they used to uh, control their market size, control the amount of uh, wine that will be pushed into the market and all those kind of uh, logistic activities they would plan all the uh, manufacturing activities as, all as well. So now what they are doing is they have come up with certain kind of sensors which can look at the bunch of the grape and then determine the number of grapes in that bunch. By doing that and by knowing the number of blocks there uh, they can also determine how which block which have how will have how many how many how, many, how much amount of yield. So not only a vineyard wise, a block wise prediction of yield is available. So then it can also help. So now they are, what they are doing is they are planning to push this data into a central cloud in a crowd server where they will analyze this data and try to come up with solutions where they will give the predictions of okay here the soil salinity has to be increased or decreased to give, give a better yield or here the, there is no yield predicted for the next 20 years. Let's not focus on this part of the vine vineyard. Let's focus into other parts. So these kind of impacts is having in the daily life of people who are uh, of the grassroots level people. Yeah. So now coming to patentability of IoT. 
these solutions. So, uh, although this thing may seem a bit uh, different, so these are sections from the Indian Patents Act. So now, what are the challenges when someone sees that uh, can I patent a collection of five sensors? There were only one sensor available. I am having five sensors doing the same job in the same manner and having the same output. But only thing is, I have since I have five sensors, I get more number of data points. Can I patent this? So there was one sensor. I had let's say one output at a particular uh, place uh, at a particular one out uh, output temperature at a particular place of the pipe. And they are saying I am having five sensors and I am getting five output outputs. Only this. Concept can this be patented on? Without anything else, if you do not add anything else to this, this cannot be patented. This may be may face an objection under section three. So section three is basically section three F specifically. It is basically gives out a list of cases which cannot be patented in India. This is specific to Indian law, and uh, I have also focused the presentation specific to India only. So this. F says that unless and until there is some interaction between your devices and between your components of the devices, you cannot just merely claim an arrangement or rearrangement of that. For example, uh, it's it's like this. For example, if I have three this kind of components in my device, okay. Now, initially there was one component. I'm just adding three components, and I'm saying this is my new device. And how, how it is new? Because it has my two new components. Let's say these are two new components also. Not in this kind of device. Let's say these were used in some other device. Some other device. I have taken that, that from there and put it here. So can this be patented? My answer to that would be no. Unless and you can provide some linkage between them. Let's say I add a thread to each of these and one cannot move unless the other one is moved. The, Threads are tied to them in such a manner. So then there is certain kind of certain kind of effect that is coming out because of that arrangement and reality. So when then we have to come to this, this effect is basically called a synergistic effect. What ma'am was also telling that it should not be like so one plus two, if I say it's three, this is my invention. Someone might say that 3F is there, it cannot be patented. If I say 1 plus 2, 3 plus delta is there, so yes. And this delta is basically the interaction. Interaction that I am talking about. And that interaction should have a effect. It should have a positive effect, a better effect. It should function in a different manner. The functionality should be different or enhanced. So that's why mere arrangement may not be patentable, will not be patentable if it's uh, regards to the IoT related inventions. Now again, another big hurdle with which IoT related inventions generally face is with regard to Section 3K. Now Section 3K basically says that computer programs, business methods, and algorithms cannot be patented. So the question then comes that does that mean if I have a new algorithm and that's implemented to analyze my IoT data, can that not be patented? Answer is yes, if you can see that that algorithm has a technical effect. Now when I say it has a technical effect, I mean that effect should something should be on something visible, should, should be on something tangible. So that output data is on some visible entity. As long as I can tie it with, I can uh, connect it with that visibility of that tech, of that uh, output, then I can say yes, it is patentable. Whether it be an algorithm, whether whatever it be, it will be claimed in a form of a method. So we will basically write that yes, this is a method for doing so and so steps. And the method is, doing, is done by a system or by a model or by some processor that is doing it. So we'll say a processor is doing so and so, is first sorting the data, is then deduplicating the data, is then reducing, reducing the redundancy, and then he is do, the processor itself is doing some computation based on some AI models to 
get some meaningful insights. That is then sent for controlling the that. Something like that. So there has to be a technical effect that is visible from it, and there has to be a technical contribution. Problem and solution helps us here. So there we say that yes, there's a problem that was there, which is solved by the present invention. And that problem was a practical problem, a physical problem. So this is another kind of challenge. So this is basically a whole month long topic for uh, now students. So, but without going to the depth of it, this 3K is again a problem with uh, patenting of AI later in invention. And we as claim drafters or as patent drafters have to be very careful of how we draft our claims. For example, uh, I was getting a question that uh, whether my my professor is doing something and whether I can patent that algorithm or not. So yes, you cannot patent that algorithm. That is there. But you can claim what that algorithm is doing. And if it is doing in a new way, an inventive way, and it has a, a visible impact on anything, on, on a part of the process, it maybe the processing is faster, maybe the data that the, the output data is in a, such a format that it, it can be stored easily. Maybe the output data is in a, such a format it can be communicated easily. Maybe uh, the output lesser number of output data helps us in getting a better result. So any kind of technical improvements, if you are coming up with these kind of things, can be claimed as a method, and that then that algorithm <coughs> would be created as a method, not an algorithm as such, but as a method. So sir, this is what section 3K is. Sir, yeah, sure. Sir, uh, actually, uh, uh, according to business model, if I uh, if we think, then Flipkart was the first company to introduce cash on delivery, which uh, helped to increase their uh, sales by a huge amount. So can that be patented or something? Yeah. So this, when you say very good, that's a very good question. In the sense that when you say cash on delivery. As a business model, if you, I think they have a patent on it. I think they have filed for an application. I don't know whether it's granted in India or not, but I think they have filed an application on that. So the concept of cash on delivery, that's a business concept. Yes, sir. Right? Yes. So per se, it cannot be patented. But in a patent document, so if Flipkart comes to me and says, I have this, is there a way to protect this? So when you are saying cash and delivery, it's not. Uh, why are, are you saying? Why are you thinking of a patent? It's such a. If it's such a business concept. If it's a known business concept, why are you at all thinking about a patent? Because it's not simple cash and cash and delivery. It's not like buying, going to the shop, buying a product, and, you, and then you say that okay, uh, you spoke home delivery. You send it to my home. I'll give you the cash there. This is not that kind of model. There is a. Technical interface involved in it. E it was the first e-commerce company. Correct. Now my e-commerce platform comes into the picture. Now when I am the person who is drafting the claim for that patent document, what I will think of is that Flipkart has come up with a, an improvement in an application. Or I will say with an improvement in their platform. Where they are providing another option for the user to choose between cash on delivery or pay right away. Now, the, so for example, as you would know, when you are when you are getting an algorithm to publish that cash on delivery option there, there will be certain things you are doing differently, right? It it may be like for example, you want to publish a cash on delivery option first in the list, and then you so for example. So this is the item, let's say you are buying from Flipkart. Okay. You can see the technical specifications of the item somewhere here, some part here and some part in the bottom where it says more here. And then you can say COD, then pay now, and then you can say that something like Paytm. Or something like that. I think this option is not there, thus I just created it up. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so your invention is with coming up with this interface where the algorithm allows you to give such an option. Now, you may say that if the algorithm allows me to give this option, it can allow me to give this option as well. 
correct? But then it's it's again a case to case specific basis. My question to the inventor goes there that what are you doing differently to get this here? <coughs> Maybe he wants to he has tweaked something in his algorithm to move it from here to here and that has given him um, and for that he has to change some logic in the algorithm then the invention would be directed to that logic to that method obviously I cannot claim this I cannot say that I am populating this in a screen and this is my invention obviously I cannot claim this and I'll, I also cannot claim the business model of speed but the method in which this algorithm functions if it is new and inventive I can do that and one thing of proving something new and inventive, one way of proving something new and inventive is very, is saying that the end result is new and inventive. If you can say the end result of a method is new and inventive, it's very difficult to argue against that if the end result is new, how can the method be known? Correct? So in this sense, you have to claim it as a method, not as a business method, not claimed as a process basically, not as a business method. But algorithm can you can just add a couple of lines and that can you know yeah so again I have to go it's a very case case to case specific as that what I said again we have to go into the depth of what is done differently and that is the basic exercises that we do so again I give an example where uh, we go to many uh, say uh, inventor interview where uh, the algorithm is they have come up with a novel algorithm and I know it's a computer program but just by knowing that it's a computer, so everything is a computer program. I mean, whatever you are doing in the IoT space, you are improving some analysis, some processing. Maybe an advantage, maybe like he has. I mean, what I need to think of as a patent attorney is I need to think of a tangible effect of it. And maybe a tangible effect of it is he has to to fit it within the screen. He has to reduce the size of each of the options. Then, for that, he must must have done something. Okay. So I'm just giving you an example. So there, the invention would focus of the invention would shift. It no, would not be on the, on the business model, but somehow it would be on the method that allows to give you the business model. So there, I have to think of intelligent ways of claiming it, and it depends on any case-to-case -case specific basis. Then I have to convey to the inventor that, sir, this as such you wanted is not going to happen. But what can be done instead is this one, and this can also give you a similar result because. Unless until I make it fit within that, no user would like it to, to use it. For example, if, if you fit the entire screen with all those options and the product itself is not visible, visible to you while ordering it, will anyone want to use it? No. So that would be the focus of the invention. So my problem solution, again, when we think of inventions, it's always a problem and a solution. So I have to change my problem solution approach accordingly. So this would be the... So these are some challenges we basically face and the last one is presentation of information. It says that mere presentation of information is not patentable. This is again a very case to case specific uh, objection and this can be easily overcome by showing some kind of interaction. And this is the first two I would say are more difficult to uh, overcome as a challenge from the patent office. But the third one is more easier to overcome and once I show that, show that there are some technical elements involved, I'm using some processor, I'm using some data interaction that's actually happening there, so it becomes l less of a valid objection. It would be invalid in certain cases. So this is again, I think, a repetition of what I had already discussed. Now I would come to the enabling technologies of IoT. So I had said that IoT is there, and there are certain technologies which would enable IoT. So here I have discussed a point there that says data collection okay, and analysis. Now this difference between these two aspects, collection and analysis, is reducing day by day. Now I had said that everybody is aware of cloud computing. Uh, edge computing, people are aware of? People are aware of computing. How many of you are aware? Yeah. So, it's a very new technology, it's a very upcoming technology and companies like HP, IBM and um, Intel also are involved in this field. <coughs> what they are doing is, so initially as IoT data is sent, captured by the sensors, sent to the cloud and there they are doing the processing. 
Now, again, in certain applications, this kind of latency is undesirable. They want to process the data and get the outputs right away. For example, IoT is employed in a, in a scenario of a manufacturing center. And that data is controlling certain other inputs of, let's say, certain other uh, actuators. Now, what happens is that if you stop that time, if, if it takes too much time to process the data and send it back, the manufacturing unit would stop. And they cannot afford that. The unit cannot stop. So the analysis has to be done then and there. So they come up with a solution that let's make the devices which are connecting the sensors to the cloud more intelligent. So what they are doing is they are making intelligent hubs, intelligent gateways. They are putting some part of the processing resource and the uh, uh, memory inside the gateway itself. And there they are computing there as well as some of the computing power and there they are putting some of the intelligence for doing the analysis, at least a portion of it. And if we do kind of predictive analysis, that thing is moved to the cloud. So this is kind this kind of divided infrastructure that they have got. And they are calling it an edge IQ. Edge is also not a, a standard term. People use two kind of terms. One they call the core uh, the cloud as a core and this as an edge. So edge device and core device, this kind of uh, terminologies are used. So this is again a coming an upcoming sector where uh, companies are investing a lot of uh, money. Uh, this is again a uh, picture of how edge computing works. So it says that it's, it is white's edge, it's, they say it's at the edge of the network. So what is the edge of the network? The sensors are at the edge of the network. And if I consider it, so it shows like that. So that these are the IoT sensors. It shows a, a, a human using a mobile device as a wearable device. It shows a, uh, a machining system, it shows a, a machining system, it also shows an AI system, so key, everything, this phone, this part, this is part of my IoT device. These are all my IoT devices. So what they're doing is they're doing some local processing there, at the edge, and then they are moving <coughs> the other data to the cloud and the data center. So this is again one more aspect of IoT. Now, how are IoT innovations? powered by AI. Very evidently, the analysis part, it is where the AI inventions are, AI uh, innovations are lying. So, AI as we know, the natural language processing, for example, Alexa, the health diagnostics, and AI in cloud, so this is another aspect where IoT is uh, uh, powered by AI. Yeah, now, with production of AI, uh, IP protection of AI related inventions. EP, uh, I mean the European Patent Office is a step ahead in the sense that they have come up with uh, a guideline for examination of AI uh, inventions. So the problem with AI inventions lie in two parts. First is with the when a, a human invents something on AI, we are ready to accept it. But when an AI machine creates another AI, there comes the problem of inventorship of AI. So here I will not, I'll not go into the second aspect of it because it is again more focused on the inventorship aspect of an AI invention. I will focus on the first part where humans have created AI systems and that AI system has some capability to give further predictions based on new data sets. So the EPO has basically uh, laid down a guideline that has come up recently in 2018 itself, which says that as long as you can prove, it's, it's similar uh, to the way we uh, we argue or we substantiate that a technical, uh, that a computer related invention. So uh, just to give a background, computer related inventions are always a, a problem for the Indian patent office. The moment they will see that there is some processing done by a uh, that they, they will say it as a general purpose computer. They will say, okay, this is just a computer and you are doing something with the code. So, this is not. So, to that, so and they will object it under section 3K where it says the computer program is not paid. So, they will say that, okay, we have changed the code or part of it, we have done nothing with the hardware, there is no change of interaction, so it is not paid. What is the way out of it? We sub, sub, submit, we substantiate that when the code, so
So it is not like the code is isolated from the hardware. If there is no code sitting on the hardware, the hardware won't function this way. So what we try to substantiate it is, this is the functionality we are claiming. And this functionality is technical. And how we do it is basically we say that this is not an abstract function. So we have to, sometimes we give more hardware features, we add more hardware features in the independent theme. We say that there is some kind of mapping and then some kind of uh, determination that's done. And we say that the processor is doing this kind of determination. And since there's some interaction between the code and the processing unit, so therefore there is, it's a invention that is coming. It's, a, it's more than a computer program. It's, I'm not claiming the code itself. I'm claiming the function that is being done by it. So that is how we try to rule out of that. And the EPO is saying the same logic can be applied for AI related inventions as well. At least for inventions which are uh, AI related inventions which are invented by a human. I'm not talking about AI to AI. So this is the same test that EP says. They have clearly said that we'll uh, apply the same test for, uh, for AI related inventions. And again, a problem with AI related inventions is as a patent drafter, we uh, sometimes face a problem of writing a claim for an AI related invention. The problem comes when, so there's a, I understand, so there is a fixed data set. There is a fixed data set which fights fight for a training model and that, mo that model gives the output and then there may be a desired output here which is compared and based on that basically this should come like this and based on that the model is fed with that deviation and if it sees that there is some deviation from the desired output, it will modify its own uh, set to get the get closer to the desired output. And once it does, does, this, does this exercise on more and more data sets, the output becomes closer to the desired output and the deviation becomes zero. Up till this, it is fine because it is here is a fixed data set. The thing is, even if I remove this fixed data set and I have a new data set which is completely different from this data set, the system has got some intelligence due to those processing that it can use this intelligence on this data set and get a desired output. So now it becomes a problem for the patent attorneys to find out that because the inventor also does not have the idea what that data set could be. That data set could be anything. They will just, they, it's called training the model as you guys would already know. It's called training the model. So once a model is trained enough to give a output, desired output, it will use the new data sets to give the desired output. So here with new data sets, when, so now when, a, let's say we have a patent on an AI invention and someone is using a different kind of data set to train the model and the output is same. So would that be patentable or not? So there lies a question there. So there, it should not be patentable. Ideally, it should not because you already have that model trained in that similar way to give that similar output. But since we do not have the foreseeability of that new data set, so as Nam had said, we try to put a laundry list. So we ask, what can be the other kinds of data sets? What can be the different kinds of things that can be implemented here? Give us different kinds of output that can be obtained from here. So we put it as dependent claims there and we try to give a maximum coverage. So we keep the independent claim broad based on the training model and then we try to give more and more and more data sets and that's why we ask for results. So it's, I'm talking about complete specification obviously. So at that stage we, we ask for more and more results and we put those results inside the specification to firstly to show enablement and secondly to in case there's a suit later in a, a litigation later so that can be used to substantiate that this invention actually covered that aspect also. So this is one challenge that we face. It's just uh, insight that I was, I was sharing. 
Uh, again, the US has, uh, regarding the other standards of uh, examining AI based inventions, the US has uh, again followed a similar approach that as long as they can say that something is usable and tangible, it's similar to calling it technical. So it's almost the same thing. So, but uh, as long as they are not abstract, we will grant the patent on AI. With regard to the Indian Patent Office, there lies a question mark. Because Indian Patent Office has very recently started examining uh, patent applications or on AI. Because most of the AI, initial AI patent applications have been filed in the PCT and they are getting entering the national phase in India. So we are getting less number of examination reports from the Indian Patent Office on how this exam how this invention will be seen as uh, how this invention will be seen uh, or judged by the patent examiners. So yesterday uh, we got a draft uh, manual from the patent office. I was just checking if there is something uh, regarding the AI related inventions. There, I couldn't find anything. But uh, I was also checking that whether there was some update regarding CRI, uh, examination of CRI related inventions. I couldn't find anything new. Only thing I saw is they have uh, brought in the Joint Par Parliamentary Committee uh, uh, report there. It was there previously also, but they have highlighted it and they are, in the manual they have put it that anything ancillary there too and uh, develop there upon that is developed on the computer can be patentable. It's not per se not patentable. As long as it has a technical effect, it is patentable. So it just says that. So it's it's not very clear how the Indian Patent Office is going to look upon these inventions. But nevertheless, this kind of uh, it it can be uh, assumed or it can be presumed that more or less a test similar to the EP will be applied to the Indian Patent Office, considering the similarity of laws in both those two. So that is how I believe uh, Indian Patent Office would be looking to AI. Uh, just one small sure. question. Yeah, sure. Has any AI patent been granted in India? Single one at all? To my knowledge, I, I, I don't know. Any IoT patent till now? I, so IoT patents are there. I, so again, IoT, when I say IoT patent, mm -hmm. it may be based on a 5G standard. There are patents on it. No, it, not the ancillary things. The, but the core is IoT. Let's say device management. I'm not talking about let's say IoT billing. Yeah, or IoT work, anything that Yeah, yeah, there are IoT patents there. There are IoT patents which are getting uh, So, in the data, I mean, it cannot be an... Uh, it, the term, I, I, I just have a small problem with the term IoT patent because you won't, I mean, you won't be claiming it in a manner that it's an IoT patent. You'll be claiming it in a manner because there is no single person working on it. There will be different... So, IoT as a term itself is very broad. So, there will be different universe, different... Uh, Institutions or organizations working on different portions of it. So and the applicants will be different. So in that sense, there are portions of it in I just just the sensing portion, the data communication portion, the analyst portion. There are a lot. How is there any uh, information about how many uh, AI related patents being filed? Not granted is fine, but I have to look upon that. <laughs> I have not checked that, but uh, I can uh, surely look upon that. And yeah. So yeah, any more questions? So we'll keep it to the end. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this part is one of my favorite parts in the sense that it's regarding the communication part of IoT, and here patenting is uh, at its peak. Although the 5G standard is not launched in uh, in the world, but it's there. I mean, patents are there and. Also, the SSO is trying to implement it in device. I mean, by launched, I mean it's not implemented in devices as of yet. But there are 5G patents, and these are standard initial patents. Now, what is a standard initial patent? So, there's a standard setting organization for each of these communication test standards, and they Sit together, there's a group of companies that sit together and decide that okay, this part of the technology can be used as a part of the standard. Provided that the person who is owning the patent on that signs an agreement with that, with the standards and government. And that agreement is basically called a friend agreement. Fair, reasonable, and non-disclosed, non-designatory agreement. So it's more a competition law aspect of it, but it's linked, it's linked with patent law. So once a uh, company allows that SSO, that standard setting organization, to use that uh, standard, uh, we use the technology as a part of the standard, then the SSO can implement that as a part of that standard. 
after signing that agreement. So this is generally a standard essential patent. Now, why it's so important is in the telecommunication sector, majorly, it's really moving very fast. One. Second part is to implement now. Once I launch some devices with a new standard to any ensure connectivity with other devices from other vendors, I need to implement it on a standard. That is the basic requirement of a standard. So now for implementing these standards, if I do not own the patent on it, I need to get a permission from the person who owns the patent. And this permission is basically called the license. And since it is the patent is for a standard, or the patent is based on a standard. Therefore, we have that friend thing to ensure that every other vendor can implement it. So, now, so here are some statistics again. This is basically so. Uh, Huawei, I can point. I, I uh, Samsung is there, but I believe Huawei and ZTE and their Qualcomm there. They are the main leader. Samsung, although the list shows that Samsung is uh, the leading one in patents. So these are basically the number of patent families. So patent families is the let's say the individual inventions or technologies that are there. I mean individual patents, let's say. So Samsung has the highest number of 5G patents all over the world, and then followed by Huawei and ZTE. So main I have identified that mainly Huawei, ZTE, and Qualcomm are the major players. Including Samsung are the major players in this 5G technology, and they have started patenting as long as five, six years back on this 5G te technology based on this 5G uh, standard. So this again shows that yeah, the, again the implementation of 5G in the automotive sector, as I was saying, that here these are the green ones are basically the patent family. So we can consider the green ones because those are the individual patents. A single patent may be filed in different countries, and therefore the second black line is for the now different patents in the different countries. So the green one is, is basically the number of patents that are there in the automotive sector. So again, this is regarding that. Yeah, I will come to this one. So what are these phantom? So and why are this important? So for example, let's say Qualcomm has a 5G standard, and Apple in its smartphone has to implement it, and he buys, and he has to get the license from Qualcomm. So what Qualcomm did is, Qualcomm said, okay, I'll give you a license from the standard, buy my chip. Okay. So Apple said, why are you doing this? You are not allowed to do this under the phantoms. Now, what are the phantoms say? The word fair basically means it's on the terms of the licensing. So when you have a 5G standard, uh, 5G uh, standard essential patent, then you should follow fair terms for licensing. What do you mean by fair terms? You should not bundle that license with any other product or license. You should not have a buyback option. Like you should not have that. Okay, I am giving you a license on this uh, standard that only if you buy my, uh, my other license on that standard. This should not be there. Exactly what Qualcomm, what Qualcomm was doing with Apple is, Apple asked, wanted to buy the uh, FIG standard from Qualcomm, wanted the license on the FIG standard from Qualcomm, and for that he said, no chip, no license policy. So Qualcomm had that no chip, no license policy, so there will be components that are there, and there will be the uh, technology that are implemented in this component. So, Qualcomm said, you buy the component, I'll give you the license on that technology. Apple said, I cannot do that because this is one. Second part is, Qualcomm was charging Apple a license fee based on the entire devi device sale of Apple. So, Apple said, okay, I am buying this technology, this is implementing this particular component. Let's say, it's implemented in a Snapdragon processor to connect the phone to the PlayStation. Okay. Now, Apple said that okay, on the number of units of that processor I'm buying for from you, I will give you a license, a license fee. So if I'm, I'll give you 1.5 dollar for each of those processors that I'm buying from you, and each of those products where I'm using the processors which I'm selling, which I'm selling to the market. But then Qualcomm said no, you have to give me a share of the entire product, the Apple iPhone that you are selling, in which you are using that. 
in which you are using the processor. So they said that I need seven dollars per phone that you are selling. So this is again what they said is not reasonable. The rate that you are fixing for my licensing it not is not reasonable because it is not based on the technology that you are licensing to me. It's based on something else. You are you are charging me for my own sales. If I am selling more number of iPhones to the market, then Apple has to pay more to that Qualcomm. So what Apple did is Apple just said I will not use Qualcomm at all. They they have stopped using Qualcomm chips. They have gone to Intel, and they are buying Intel chips. Again, they will be coming back. Uh, they will be coming back, maybe. Yeah. So again, this this is a. So then what happened is the Federal Trade Corporation in U.S. noticed this. And what they had started is they filed a case against this Qualcomm that you are not licensing your 5G patents under fair and reasonable terms. So therefore, you are violating competition. How you are violating competition? They said you are saying buy your chip with the license. Thereby, you are putting the other chip manufacturers who do not have a 5G patent to a disadvantage. So you are saying buy my standard and my chip. So other chip manufacturers like Intel and any other manufacturer, they will be at a disadvantage because no one will buy their chip because the standard is anyway needed and the standard is anyway with Qualcomm. So therefore there is a case that was filed between Qualcomm, uh, by the FTC against Qualcomm and there was a hearing in January itself in 2019. A decision from the court is awaited on it and the, since looking at the uh, facts of this case, the judge has asked for more time to give a decision on this case. So. Nevertheless, the, what I'm trying to portray is the impact of a patent before even launch of the product. Someone just asked me a question that if I have launched a technology in the market and uh, then how do I address it? So you should have thought about it before. So that's what initially also I was telling that when you are going for a startup, th even if it, the startup comes up in a room with a, in a hostel room with few students doing uh, the uh, basic groundwork on the how the technology is going to be done and everything else, you should at least have it registered first. Get a DIPP registration. First have a name fixed for the startup and get everything done in the name of the startup and not on your individual names. It's because later when you are going to, going to get a patent or any kind of IP related right and things go sour between the two partners, you never know how it is going to end. So, there is a documentation that is required. So again, this has to be thought of prior to that. So that is what I was uh, trying to say. And uh, uh, excuse me, yeah. you said that uh, licensing on the basis of the amount of sales of the product, uh, that is against this prime term. So like, what are the possible ways of licensing? Yeah, the possible ways of licensing is component based. So, <coughs> so for example, your uh, technology will be implemented in the component, right? Mm -hmm. So. The price of the component or the number of units of the component that have been used in the product and sold to the, I mean, and then sold to the market, so on the component price. Okay. So you get the percentage of the component, uh, get the license fee based on the price of the component or the units of the component that you are procuring from a vendor. This is how you calculate them generally. So this is an accepted test in the European Union and the European Patent Office, I mean, European Union and also in the US. So questions are welcome. Uh, what will happen if this situation happens in India? Because in Indian Patent Act ACP is not mentioned. ACP, so Indian Patent Act will have, even the, uh, I, I do not believe that the US Patent Act will be having an ACP provision. It's basically a competition law. Uh, it's, it's called, so it's a bit in depth. The question is a very good question. So it's basically, so patent law gives a monopoly right. Okay. And the competition law basically says you cannot have a dominance mm -hmm. over the market. So by the nature of these two laws, these are against each other. So this competition, this is a competition law concept which has brought about that. Where, so this is SEP has come up to prevent patent holdups. So what is a patent holdup? So a patent holdup is basically I may be a standard holder, I may be a SEP holder, and what I do is I get that SEP and I stick with it and I'll say I'll only give it to the people who are sitting in the first row and to no one else. Then you being the manufacturers and the person in need to implement that technology won't be getting that. And since I have the patent, I have the right to whom I choose to license to, to enable that kind of licensing. So you must not have, so India has something called compulsory licensing. 
US do not, does not have such, such things. The patent owner can choose who to license to. So this can also come under the compulsory licensing terms, but such a case is awaited in India. I mean, whether if an SAP holder holds up his patent in India and do not want to license it to other uh, manufacturers, will compulsory licensing provisions apply or not? That's a very different question. So it is a more competition law perspective and Yes, so if uh, I missed your question again, so this if uh, is the question answered or I digress somewhere? It's it's okay. Yeah, so uh, basically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. 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 That's the person who is actually implementing that patent. Yes, but unless and until it's implemented in a standard, the patent has no value. I mean, it may have some value, but it will ha not have that havoc value once it's implemented in a standard. So, that's why, that is the very purpose of this brand agreement. So, it is a both way balance that is striking. So, the standard setting organization says, I'll implement your technology into the standard only when you start sign this brand agreement. Or else, if you do not want your technology to be implemented in the standard, I don't mind. I will implement something else. So, so my question is, uh, yeah. when there is, uh, when the US does not have compulsory licensing, mm. and my patent is so essential that every person who is operating in that, in that sphere will have to use the technology that is claimed in my patent. Mm -hmm. So, should I just, uh, not sign this agreement and just go and as a person who ends up using that agreement instead. It's basically what your question is coming from a step forward, and I'll move to a step backward in the sense that you were saying that my technology is so useful that everyone is using it. Okay. So in the telecommunication sector, so it's it does not happen that suddenly tomorrow the next day someone is started started using 5G uh, chips. It cannot happen that way because interoperability will not be there. And that is again the very definition of a standard and that is why a standard needs to be set first, then the manufacturers would use it. So, so it is again, why a SSO is set, a uh, standard setting organization, why is it set up? Is it, it is set up to currently address this problem. For example, going by your uh, narrative, it would be like, I feel, so let's say five companies feel that this technology is very essential. Rest 15 may feel, okay, this is not, something else is essential. Rest 25 may feel, okay, I'm getting a cheaper license for other kind of technologies, I'll implement it there. So then the tech, it will move nowhere. There will be no progress in technology. So first the standard exists, and then it has to be implemented. So that. If the product is of high spectrum, can it directly go to the market? Market. Again, uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether you attended the previous one or not. So for that, you need to do a freedom to operate search. So for example, let's say, I, I'm assuming that you're not interested in patents. Okay. Let's say I not want a patent. I want to launch a product in the market. You feel there's a value for that product. Now, for that, you have to see whether your product itself. So it's like, it's no more like an invention of a wheel. We call it a wheel example. We do not reinvent everything starting from the beginning. Obviously, the product would have been based on certain elements. So, uh, this example is not there. there. There was a chair example. So, the product would have been uh, based on certain other technologies. So, before you launch in the market, you have to see whether your product is infringing on those technologies or not. If not, then you are free to launch your product. Don't worry about it. If yes, then you would recommend it to go on get a license from them, get a permission from them that I am using so and so parts of your technology and I am going to launch a product and you can go ahead after you get that license. So that's the reason. So in case yeah. it's a similar question, like I've asked you about the assembly of different sensors. Already bought those sensors, ready-made sensors, those company are selling to. I've bought them, I've put them in a, uh, I've assembled them. So mere assembly doesn't get me a patent. So I want to launch it as a product. Can I do that? Yeah, you can do that again. The answer is same. Yeah, if not, not infringing. Sir, so 
separate uh, something like of open source is there. For example, sir, Arduino is an uh, open source protocol. So can I develop something on it and like uh, paste it? Yeah, the question is very nice and good that you ask. But the point is, I have to go back to the terms of the open source licensing. And you must have seen any open source license, there would be some term, it will say basically that once you have something in open source and you build upon it, you have to keep in open source. So you cannot proprietize it. So that is the very basic essence of open source. So any GNU GPL license, any kind of open source, Apache license, any kind of open source license, that will have a basic line terms 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 that will say that you are allowed to use this code freely, whatever you do or want to do with it, but keep it true, do not prove it. So that's it. So sir, if I develop something completely new and I want to keep it open source, I will have to get an open source license for it. Correct. So that no one gets a patent using my thing. Uh, you, can, you can just publish it over the internet. No one will get a patent on it. If you just want to prevent someone from getting up. So that's again the objective. So what do you want? So you have come up with a, let's say a port from the scratch. Just assume that you have come up with a algorithm or a port from the scratch. And you do not, so you do not want to patent, patent it. You do not want to sell it to someone. You just want that no one should manufacture it. So there is another thing, no one should use it or manufacture it. Or manufacture devices based on it. So or there is another thing. Which is called exclusive rights. Or correct, that. correct. I, I understood your point. So we have, there is something called defensive publication. Patenting uh, context is something called different publications. It's more or less like a patent specification. But what we do is we draft it and put it in the public domain. And then, once it's in public domain, no one can have a patent. So, this Facebook LinkedIn with professional sites disclose that. I mean, that prevent that specimen. I, I didn't get your question. That social, yeah. social uh, science, uh, if, if some, uh, something is closed, for the intention, mm. will it, can, it, can it be used by others for getting Others for, if something is disclosed in a public interface, domain, yeah, domain that, that whether that can be patented or not? By everybody. No. So, since it's disclosed in the public domain, so it can be. Yeah. Yeah. Consider record. Yeah. Done. Yes, ma'am. Any questions? I think now we should take a break. Any any further questions? Yeah, yeah. Please. When you do a search for patent, the existing patent search, so I can about to file a patent. Then I will be searching it in India only or to global search. If you want to so find a Professor Raj, in India. No, no. another topic and I think she can also do is search. Yeah. FDI that's search. very important. That's the first thing that somebody should do. Now you go ahead. FDI as well. But Pradeep, you must have the patent now before you do that. <laughs> yeah. I was asking that whenever, whenever we are searching for an existing technology or whatever, if it, the patent is already registered in some other country, can I file in our, this country or some other Yeah, patent is a territorial right. So, for example, when something is filed in the US, and it's patented that you can file in the same department in India. But again, you should not take that, and you should also know that you cannot implement that. Any other private repository is known like they do. There's a lot of. We generally call it search 